<laughs> Welcome to bonus episode number two, everybody. In this episode, we're talking about creating OER materials and some of the lessons learned. And our first question goes to the group. Uh, the World Civilization One course was created as part of a Department of Education grant secured by Lewis, the Louisiana Library Network. I understand that you all worked together to create this course. Would you kindly introduce yourselves and explain each of your roles? Thanks, Ryan. So my name is Lisa Namikas. I'm a professor at Baton Rouge Community College, and I've been an instructor in Louisiana for 15 years, uh, teaching and, uh, you know, for the last eight at my home college in Baton Rouge. Um, my role in this project was to serve as a content expert, and so uh, I worked with the other faculty members, and we looked at the available materials and decided, you know, what we could use and remix and what we needed to produce to ultimately end up with uh, materials for a course in world history, from the textbook then to some of the supplements and ancillary materials. Hello there again. Again, my name is Crescencio Jackson. I am an instructor here at Louisiana Delta Community College. I have been teaching, I believe it is now 12 years here in the state of Louisiana, and I've been here at Louisiana Delta full time for about, uh, I guess, about seven, eight years now. And I teach all histories here. We offer at Louisiana Delta, American history, world history, Louisiana history. I actually was a little bit an outsider in this group. I was not a part of the World Civilization One cohort with you all. I was actually in the American History One with another cohort with Lewis Library. So I kind of joined in a little bit later. So I, I'm getting a chance to get a, a be a part of this great group as well. But I have enjoyed it thus far. And like I've said in earlier intros, I really do like this uh, particular OER project and I hope it can be something that we can move forward with on a, even a higher level going forward. My name is Chris Gilson. I'm an associate professor of history at Northwestern State University. I've been teaching in Louisiana for about eight years now, and um, I serve, uh, like Lisa, as a content expert, uh, particularly for um, European history, late medieval, early modern Renaissance history. Um, that's been my primary component of participating in this project, but it's this world history, so we're all um, having, a, we all have an opportunity to um, contribute to a, a wide variety of different um, uh, subjects as we've worked our way through this. I was a part of the original textbook project and then again a part of this podcast project because uh, it was a natural outgrowth of that that first project that once the textbook was in place, um, providing ancillary materials is so critical to encouraging course adoption by faculty and utilization by students. So I'm excited about what we've accomplished and uh, look forward to seeing what happens next. Hi hey again, everyone. Uh, my name is Amelia Brister. I am the Director of Library and Learning Resources at Louisiana Delta Community College. My role on this project was to be the librarian cohort leader. And what that entailed was scheduling meetings, checking the Creative Commons licensing, uh, help set deadlines, keep the project on track, and work as the liaison between the Group for the World Civ project and Lewis, who actually wrote and managed the first grant. Tell us a little bit about creating the course, writing the textbook, piloting the course in just about two years. I mean, it sounds very overwhelming, but can uh, any of you begin to tell us or take us through the process? Well, I'll start with that. Um, Lewis, our Louisiana Library Network, which is our consortium that connects all of our academic libraries in the state of Louisiana, um, set up the overall project. They wrote the grant that was funded through the Department of Education. I believe it was a $2.1 million grant. Um, it, so it was a, a very large project. Um, they provided um, the workspace, the Moodle module course shell. Um, they set up professional development for library uh, cohort leaders. Um, we learned about project management, best practices, creative commons, licensing, um, and then they built out the team. Um, they put out a call for participants and interested parties applied and then were connected with us, the librarians who led these small cohorts. I believe some 
groups had six members, some had four. Um, it really depended on who applied and how many they had for each of the subject areas. So um, my job was to help everybody by, you know, kind of managing the project um, individually. Talk about what it was like revising an existing textbook, creating the course, and then adding and creating H5P activities to the textbook, which, by the way, for the audience, we would like that to be defined. What exactly is an H5P activity? Well, I can say a few words on just writing the textbook first and then maybe moving into the H5P uh, a little bit after that. But um, I thought uh, rewriting, remixing the textbook was um, just a great experience. Uh, one thing that, you know, I guess is probably um, the nature of OERs in that it's a collection of people getting together, usually over a short time, you know, to work intensively to put together this material. And that's probably true with the original material that we started out with. And it's definitely true for us. So I think as we look at the original material, there were some differences between the chapters that we noticed and just, you know, looking back at the material. And it's kind of rewarding for us to kind of come in and try to make it a little bit more uniform with our own, you know, our own interests. So it's another overlay that's, you know, creating a little bit more uniformity than was there in the first place. And I'm sure somebody will come, you know, group will come back behind us and do the same thing. I mean, it's just, I think it's a, you know, just a, a continuous process. Um, so it was, I think, you know, for, for me, uh, just a great experience in terms of looking at a larger work and working with other people to create sort of a, uh, an enhanced product, an enhanced product. I mean, we started out with something that was good and I, you know, the, the first group around, you know, gave us a, a really good start. Um, so we're able to come around afterwards and, you know, with our own strengths, you know, get to know other faculty in Louisiana and, and figure out where our strengths are and just kind of focus in on those and produce something that's just even a level better for our students. I'd like to echo uh, what Lisa said about having really good materials to start with. Uh, we were really well positioned in this project thanks to the materials that um, came out of uh, University of North Georgia. Um, they were great OER materials to start with. What we needed to do was find a way to make them um, more accessible in an electronic format, uh, to find a way to uh, make them more accessible in multiple um, for multiple users in, in terms of whether they're using uh, cell phones or, or tablets or, or whatever they may be accessing the materials with. And we also wanted to incorporate um, more interactivity into uh, the textbook experience, including some uh, quizzes at the end of chapters and, and along the way that students could uh, interact with in a live, immediate, rapid feedback type of format. And that's what H5P uh, activities really allow you to do. I mean, in many cases, it's it's as simple as just including a, a multiple choice quiz or a matching quiz at the end of a section or at the end of a chapter, but there are, are more advanced um, versions of, uh, of H5P tools that I think we'll see added to versions of this textbook in the future as, as other people remix what we've done or as we um, make changes ourselves to, to what to what's been done. That's one of the great things about OER materials is that once that OER material is out there and that license is clearly stated that someone else can can reuse it to remix it, then any faculty member could could take that and remix it for themselves. And um, that's, I think, really one of the exciting things about this is that it it's not the kind of top down process that using a textbook always has been in the past, that there's only one set of voices that are deciding exactly what should be taught or how it should be taught. This really gave us an opportunity to have a lot of different voices with a lot of different backgrounds involved in developing this and still recognizing that someone else using it after it after us can uh, do the same thing with it. And I think that's freeing in a way. Um, as far as the process of creating the course, uh, really it was a social process because we were all interacting every couple of weeks, building off of each other's strengths and learning from the challenges that each person was facing along the way. And I think that's one of the benefits of this. And I think that's one of the reasons that the course that we created is so complete is because we were all building off of off of everyone else. And, and I think it it's really um, 
fantastic what we achieved as a group. And I think that shows in, in the course that was created. I would often tell in the beginning uh, weeks of class, you know, we have textbooks that are written by certain people and they focus on certain material because that they are the author. And that's one of the things that we were able to do with the uh, cohorts is that we were able to really focus on things that really had a lot of reference to people in our region, in our community that would help them understand it a little bit more. And that's something we often aren't able to do with a regular uh, textbook from a publisher. So that's the aspect that I really enjoyed about uh, helping to write the OER for Louisiana students. And I, I really think that would be a great asset for them as well. Professor Jackson, let's continue with you. What motivated you to take part in this particular OER creation opportunity? You know, as I said in earlier uh, parts, is that, you know, being able to have access to the textbook on first day was such a great thing for me. You know, I still, as I have said before, am a division chair, and we still have some areas in my division of liberal arts that don't have access to OER. And so this was an opportunity to ensure that at least in this history part, we could have OER that our students could use. Because in those other areas where we don't have an OER, I still see that barrier that exists is that many students just can't afford textbooks in our area. You know, even though we still have other barriers that may stop them from the OER because of internet connectivity, but just having it is a great asset for them because they don't get behind in their studies. You know, tuition is paid, but they still need a book. And so I really wanted to see uh, a way that we could get students access to textbooks on first day and they wouldn't have to come out of pocket for it. So I'm really a big fan of OERs. You know, even in this kind of side note with that, you know, one thing I have seen out of it is that OERs, you know, as we said, you can use PDF versions, but at some point you do need some access to some type of internet connectivity broadband. So I even, with this cohort, I've also been appointed to one of the broadband committees in my area to ensure that our students have it as well. So we just have to do everything that we can these days to ensure that students just have connectivity, have access to all the tools that they need to really succeed. And I know especially us here in North Louisiana, Louisiana Delta, we often lack that. And hopefully these tools will help us and really help our students as well. Professor Gilson? I was motivated to take part in this project from the very first notification that I saw about saw of it. Um, and I didn't see that notification until uh, rather late, um, maybe only a day before the uh, applications uh, were due. And so I raced to put something together, I think, sitting outside during some quarantine period of time. I don't know. And... Um, I was excited about it because I've been using OER materials off and on during my time at NSU, and students do well with them. Students are more enthusiastic about the class. They start the class with a lower stress level and a greater openness to doing the work that you're assigning for them. And because of that, they finish the class more successfully, and they end up giving higher evaluations, quite frankly, for classes that have OER materials. So those are all good reasons for the students, for the faculty. Um, the challenge often is institutional, and institutions have a tendency to make big decisions about textbooks that don't, um, don't allow for a lot of innovation. And so when I saw this project um, advertised by the state and encouraged by the institutions, I wanted to make sure that I was a part of it because I wanted to make sure that it that it stuck, that it lasted, uh, because um, similar opportunities don't don't pop up very often, and they can be crushed by market concerns and uh, questions about contracts and profitability and all of those kind of things can crush this kind of innovation. And so I wanted to make sure that I was uh, driving it rather than um, watching it die out. Professor Namikis. I think what motivated me primarily was the opportunity to be involved in creating a textbook for world history that 
you know, I really felt comfortable I could use and would want to use. I think I, you know, in all honesty, I struggled in the past a little bit. There was some talk at Baton Rouge Community College about trying OERs. And especially in world history, for some reason, they they, they just weren't, weren't something that I felt would resonate with our students, th what was online or, and what had existed previously. And so when this opportunity came around, um, that and I think just my experience with really becoming committed to access and, um, you know, serving students who don't necessarily uh, have the means to buy the expensive textbooks that, you know, I was comfortable with using. Um, you know, I thought we could, I could blend both of these together and, you know, help create something that, you know, would really work for a history class and, you know, that I would you know, really be um, happy to advocate for and, and to promote. What was the most challenging part of creating this course? I think I would have to say the work rewriting the textbook. Um, you know, when it came down to it, there was a lot of preparation um, so that when each faculty member went ahead and did their rewriting, we knew what we were doing. We were going to be consistent with each other. We had, uh, like Crescencio said, we uh, our cohort as well, we put a lot of emphasis on, you know, more inclusivity and diversity. We had that all kind of worked out and managed. And then when it came down to the actual writing, um, I think that was most challenging because, I mean, you're writing a textbook. I mean, it's just, and, you know, I was working myself on three chapters and that's a lot of work. So when we, you know, was actually starting to sit down and do it, I kind of, I had the tools, I knew what I needed to do, but, you know, it, it took some time. And, you know, that was, that was the biggest challenge, I think, from, from my point of view. Um, I, I enjoy it. I love writing. So I, you know, it was okay, but it was a challenge. So. For the other professors on the call, um, was time the most challenging part or were there other even more daunting challenges in creating the course? Starting is always difficult on something of, of this size and magnitude, significance, so forth. Um, just taking the first step to start editing the first chapter and then to start editing each individual chapter after that. Um, but once you start moving in that direction, it I think it, it started to to go a little bit a little bit more easily. Um, so starting is is one challenge, and then another challenge is, you know, being comfortable editing materials that other people have worked on. Um, just the the whole no notion of remixing and reusing, is kind of uh, I mean it's kind of a foreign concept in 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 the way we approach acad academia today i mean the idea of using other people's work seems really uncomfortable at, at first but um the whole purpose of doing that is to allow us to develop these materials that students can access uh, for free and we know that others are going to do the same thing with what we've done and so developing some comfort with that type of um, that type of work is is a challenge. And then honestly dealing with uh, images and um, co Creative Commons licensing for images was probably the, the other challenge because even in an OER textbook, you will sometimes find that there are images that either the original author did not, or not necessarily textbook, OER material of any kind, that the original author did not actually have uh, the proper permission to use that you may have to try and find something similar to to replace it with. Uh, or you may find that they had specific permission from the original copyright holder to use that in an OER text. And whether or not that license transfers to the next person is, uh, it can be a little unclear. And so in, in the cases where I encountered something like that, I was always very careful to to find um, images, maps, uh, supporting materials, whatever it may be, that I felt confident um, had the the appropriate Creative Commons licensing, and Amelia and the uh, Lewis staff were um, in, in critical resources in, in in that. Well, I will say that um, as the the librarian cohort leader, it was it was always a challenge for me. Uh, I was really worried about meeting deadlines. And I was thinking about it from this high level. I'm part of this $2 million project for Lewis and I don't want to let anybody down. So um, I, I remember I 
think it was May ish of last year when I was I was kind of getting stressed that you know some things had not been finished and I'll never forget Lisa and Chris were very like supportive and understanding and they said hey we create these all the time it's gonna be fine it's gonna be fine we're gonna finish this project and you know it it wrapped up and everything went well and you know we're here today talking about how successful it was um but i remember in the moment it was quite stressful um but i had a great team and i think that's really important anytime you're building oer projects is to have a terrific team so thank you guys for being my team what advice would you give to new instructors just starting out in their career about creating course materials would you recommend they create these materials as OER materials? Why or why not? It really depends on your institution. It's important um, that you don't do a lot of work that isn't going to be usable long term. You have to pace yourself and think carefully about how much time you have and, and what the best use of your, your time is. Um, I think probably the best way to approach that would be to try to create as many materials as you can that you can adjust for whether you're using textbooks or whether you're using OER materials. So if you're recording lectures, if you're doing podcasts, if you're creating quizzes or writing assignments, try to, to do them in a way that you can adjust to things that you can't control. And then at any point that you can drive um, your institution, your department, uh, fellow faculty towards you using, using OER, then by all means do that. But um, try to, to create the most flexibility for yourself. And when you're creating writing assignments and reading assignments, that's where you really have the ability to use a lot of OER materials that you can, um, to create assignments that you can use in, in classes, no matter what decisions about the textbook may be made, whether you control it or not. I love that answer. Um, I would add that if you are new to OERs and it, if it really intrigues you and you really want to be a, a creator of OER, to get started, I would recommend that you be a co-creator or sign on to a project similar to the Lewis Project to get experience with a group that's already deep into that area, into that um, expertise. So that you can um, have that guidance and then maybe move forward solo if that's how you choose to go. But having the team, when I first got into the OER arena, it, it was so important because I could bounce my questions off of um, other librarians across the state. So I, I think having that team is really important. And pretty much like Amelia said, I, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend this for someone that was just getting started you know you really doing it all by yourself you really need to be with a cohort or a team that kind of help because i really enjoy as i said earlier being a part of the group that we're able to bounce ideas off each other and so i don't think that and i like that idea so doing it and you're just getting out you're, you're really still trying to figure out your whole teaching uh your, your way of teaching and then also trying to write out OER, we are that might be pretty much overwhelming for a new person coming into the field so i would think it would be a great opportunity but doing it alone would probably be just too much you should probably get it with a cohort or that really and more than likely especially as this probably moves forward we'll have more institutions college universities that are going to probably adopt it on their own because it's such a great asset to that uh, institution so i would say get with your division chair your dean and maybe you could do it with a group of people at your institution versus you going it up yeah you know I, I what i would add is that you know if you are interested starting out in your career of teaching uh you know to just try throwing out a few assignments or you know maybe not a you know, whole chapter, but, you know, maybe some kind of introductions to chapters or something like that is to just test the waters and see, you know, where, you know, you might like to concentrate your energies and efforts. Um, you know, just there's many different websites you could use or, you know, like the Canvas Commons, um, you know, just to play around with small things before. We talked about great challenges in creating the course. Now let's talk about 
your biggest successes with the project? Starting with Professor Jackson, what do you feel has been your greatest success in working with this project? I would probably say one of my greatest successes, and as I've said, it's more than once, is I teach so many different areas of history and here at Louisiana Delta Community College that I really don't get a chance to focus on one particular area as much like my my cohorts and on this as well so i was able to really with american history and also world civilization get a chance to really focus on them and kind of enhance my expertise on them more than anything else. and so that was one of my greatest things is i really got a chance to go in depth and i've been able to do in my really my 12 years teaching around here as much as i've been and so that was my greatest Think about it. You know, I, I got into it for the students, but I got a chance to enjoy it as well because I didn't have to kind of bounce around like I usually have done for the past several years and got a chance to get in world civilization, got a chance to really go into American history, much like I did, you know, when I was in my graduate study. So that was a great experience, you know, to get in to really understand the material as we kind of, you know, mixed it up for the uh, for the OER. I like it. But of course, always having uh, able to gain access to material that we could share with the students is is a, a good part as well. But it was secondary somewhat as well. Success stories. This is what we're talking about right here. Success stories. Professor Namikis. I think, you know, I'd, I'd have a couple things to say uh, on success stories. Um, I piloted the course once we had it all put together. And that was a great success. I enjoyed that a lot. I thought that the students responded really well to you know, the materials that we had presented. Um, I felt the materials were fresh because they were new to me. So I felt like I had a new energy teaching. So I think you know, just from you know both angles, but you know, especially if, you know, for the students, I think that it just came together in a way that you know they they really learned well from it. And I was, you know, really proud of them on a, by the time we got to the final exam and I could see some of that. Um, absolutely. So, you know, I count that as, you know, a huge success. I think just in terms of creating the, the class, seeing how other people put materials together and how other instructors taught that was refreshing for me also, because it's nothing I, you know, really didn't pay attention to, honestly, be, you know, got my own world teaching, teaching. Um, so seeing how classes need to be put together, especially OER classes need to be put together in a way that all st instructors can use them, I think really enhanced my own ability to create an, uh, OERs. And then um, the third thing I would add is just creating the podcast has been so much fun. I find that really rewarding. It's something that I've always you know, wanted to do. Uh, I've worked online for so long and a lot of it uh, has, you know, I think in the early days, I, we did audio PowerPoints, but then that kind of fell by the wayside and it all became a little bit more textual and then now we're going back to the audio again and I've just really I mean it's it's always been missing for me you know in, the, in those intervening years and so to add more audio back in um, is something that you know I I love being a part of that I think it's so important for the students and and, and for history you know do, that's where I think the excitement about history can you know really be infectious for the students you know we can convince them that history is is meaningful and it's impactful and important um, so those are the three areas I would highlight. Professor Gilson, success. I think probably the most notable success or the most obvious success for me, just as I was completing um, final grades for courses this semester, is the fact that I saw an, a noticeable decline in, in DFW rates and, and students that were failing or withdrawing from the course, and particularly um, a decline in, in students who um, you, you, we always see students that participate for a few weeks and then start to do less and less and then at some point just stop participating completely. Um, and I, I didn't really see that um, this semester. And I was really excited to see that because I could, could draw comparisons between the last spring and this spring between classes of very, um, very similar, uh, I guess you could say student makeup perhaps or um, uh, similar co collegiate classes. They were directly com comparable from one year to another, and I saw an improvement in student performance. And I thought that was um, absolutely what the purpose of this this project was uh, to accomplish. And then on top of that, um, I saw uh, in in my dual enrollment classes, in particular, 
uh, a lot of engagement with the course. Uh, and I could, could tell that through course evaluations at the end of the semester with students expressing appreciation for um, having access to the textbook from day one and not having to pay for the textbook and having a textbook that felt um, complete, uh, that felt detailed. And, and um, I could see that in, in the comments that I received back on the course. And that's a, a really important consideration because there is so um, there is so much variety in the way uh, dual enrollment classes uh, are organized across the state and students' access to textbooks, whether it's provided by their school or whether they have to, to go and try and track it down for themselves or pay for it themselves. Uh, there's um, historically been a lot of inequality in the way that textbooks are ac accessible for dual enrollment students. And in this class, that wasn't an issue in the same way. Obviously, uh, broadband and internet accessibility, those are still things that have to be uh, dealt with in, in the future. And I'm happy to hear that we have somebody on our, on our, uh, in our group that's participating in that right now. Um, but at least in, in terms of the textbook itself, um, I think we're addressing that challenge. And I think students are noticing that. And I can tell that in, in their reactions to, to uh, evaluation questions. Ms. Bristol, can you celebrate any successes? Well, okay, so I've already said it. My biggest success is that we finished the project <laughs> from my side. <laughs> but I will say that um, getting to meet instructors from all across the state was a really great opportunity for me and seeing how they seek information, how they research, um, some of the questions they had. Um, really helped me as a librarian understand how I could be more valuable on our campus for our institution. Um, so I would say professional development was um, was really valuable for me from this project. And of course, getting to work with all of you and then roll that work over into the podcast um, was just an added bonus. This podcast episode has been produced under a CC by NCND license. All episodes in this series are made possible through the efforts of Lisa Naminkas, Christopher Gilson, Crescentio Jackson, Ryan Pierce, and Amelia Brister. Thank you for listening.